I want to talk about worst practices. But if I say worst practices, it's not necessarily worst. It's also just bad practices or things that in most cases I would do differently. So don't, don't feel offended. It's going to be just a big collection of maybe good and bad advice. Um, since the slides contain some, some good advice and also some bad advice, to confuse you a little bit less, I've marked all the bad advice with this devilish uh, icon. Um, yeah, um, so the, the agenda for this talk, I've um, yeah, basically used the good old uh, waterfall process because why would you use any, anything else? Um, so we'll start with uh, project setup, analysis, um, development, if we have time, we'll do testing, uh, otherwise go live and maintenance. Of course, we'll start with the pro uh, project setup and the important part here um, is to get a, yeah, a good use case and to get the right people in the team. So if you're looking for use case to start with Apache Flink, don't start with something simple. Start with your most challenging business critical use case, get as much management attention on it as possible. Um, that will put you in a good spot. Um, and when looking at the team, make sure there's no prior stream processing knowledge. There's just bias. Basically, let them learn that on the project. Even better, no distributed systems knowledge at all. If you have such a team, then don't train it up front. Wait until at least half into the project. They'll, they'll learn that by the documentation and so on. That's not too bad. And since there is a big confusing community around Flink, try to avoid that as well. Don't use the community. This, all of this is obviously bad advice. Um, so if, if you actually want or are looking for training or want to use the community, just two, two things I want to point you to here. There is always a training day at Flink Forward. It was yesterday. There were four um, courses. I'll invite you to join next time. Uh, there will be one in uh, Beijing again, and there will be one in San Francisco. We also have public trainings all over Europe and um, the US. Um, operations training, developer training, check it out. And I think yesterday I, I read a tweet of an um, extensive online course also going live in the next weeks. So there are plenty of opportunities. Use them. In terms of the community, um, for sure, the user mailing list is the best uh, place to start. Um, you'll get an answer roughly within a day um, on average. Um, we, we've heard a lot about the um, user mailing list already. Stack Overflow is also a good source. Fabian is giving a lot of answers there. David, who runs our trainings, is, I think, answering every second question. If you want to know uh, how not to ask questions, I've um, I've searched for the most downvoted Apache Flink questions on Stack Overflow. Um, there are a couple of gems there. You might want to check that out. Um, the Apache Software Foundation Slack workspace also has a Flink channel. You'll get answers there as well. Um, it's not as busy as the mailing list, I would say. But um, if you're using Slack already, that is definitely the most frictionless way to get engaged. Yeah, so we've, we've got our team set up. We have a project. Um, so now we start with analysis. And analysis is a lot about requirements. And here the bottom line is don't think about it too much. In particular, don't think about failure. Don't think about consistency guarantees. Probably nothing will go wrong in production anyway. Um, don't think about application upgrades. Probably won't go, into, won't go live anyway. So changing anything won't be an issue. Um, the, um, don't think about the scale of your problem. In particular, if you think about your scale, you might end up in a situation where you're processing 100 records a day, and Flink in the end might not be a good choice. Um, so better don't do that. And last but not least, don't think too much about your, your actual business requirements. Um, your internal customers or your customer will tell you those once you're in production, if you make it. I want, to, I want to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail and tell you what, what you could do if you, if you still want to. Um, so about consistency and, and delivery guarantees, I think there are basically three questions you need to answer your, um, for your use case before you go in, into any more details. Are you willing to lose records? If not, then uh, if yes, then no checkpointing at any source is totally fine. If you don't want 
to lose records, then you need to ask yourself, do you care about correct results? If you care about correct results, then you need not to uh, answer another question. If you don't care about correct results, then you can use checkpointing mode at least once. You'll have some duplication. Um, and you need replayable sources to rewind in case of a failure. If you care about correct results, then you need to ask yourself, do you care about duplicate records downstream? If you don't care about duplicate records, then you'll end up in the most common situation, I would say. You use a checkpointing mode exactly once for consistent internal state and flink, and again, replayable sources. If you cannot cope with uh, transactions downstream, then you need to use transactional things as well um, on top of everything else. So you might wonder why, why do you even, why would you choose anything but the best? Um, basically, the, the major trade-off here, I think, is, is latency. So uh, the more you move down to the left, the higher the latency will be that, you're, um, that you can achieve, I would say. Um, if you're looking for fraud detection system with 100 milliseconds end-to-end -end latency, then down left, that's, Super, super hard. Uh, um, basically, you need to bring checkpointing intervals to sub 100 milliseconds consistently and things like that. So think a little bit about if you end up down there, do I also need low latency? And if so, then try to get at least into the case of checkpointing exactly once, but no transactional things. I also told you don't think too much about application evolution. So the basics here, probably most of you know, um, your Flink user code is running, it talks to the local state backend, heap or rocksdb, and when you want to do an upgrade, you create a save point that goes to a distributed file system, and then you migrate your application for whatever reasons, maybe you want to upgrade to a new bug fix version, although I would discourage that, um, and then you load your state from your save point into the local uh, state store and you resume processing. All good. There are certain things that you can change if you take precaution. Um, when it comes to the topology, um, we have our topology before the change, we have our topology um, after the change, and what have we done? We have removed one operator. That is always possible if you use allow non-restored state, because there is some state that you don't restore. And we've also inserted a new operator down here, and this will just be initialized without any state. So just need to take care in your business logic for that. The other two operators <coughs> are still the same, um, and for Flink to know that they are still the same, you need to sign UIDs. Otherwise, they will be auto-generated by the topology, and in that case, if the topology changes, your UIDs changes, and Flink doesn't know that they match. So that's for topology changes. You can also change the state types of, or the schema of your state types. Um, if you use Avro types or Flink POJOs, there are some rules that you need to uh, adhere to, and then Flink will take care of um, schema evolution and um, state migration for you. If you don't use those, then it's going to be much more difficult. Um, in particular, if you fall back to cryo, there's no way for Flink. Cryo is basically a black box for Flink. There's no way to know whether your new state type and your old state type are still compatible, and Flink will not be able to resume from a save point if your cryo data type in state has changed. Generally, key data types cannot be changed. So if you key by something and you change that data type, add a field to that object, uh, this is not going to be possible. So if you, if you will, the worst practices here would be only to use cryo and not to assign UIDs. Then you basically have no flexibility. The good thing is there's, with Flink 1.9, there's still a way out of it um, with the state processor API, and there is a dedicated talk for that um, tomorrow afternoon by my colleague, Sess. I also talk, don't think too much about your, your scale of your problem. Of course, if you have a, um, have a project where you process 100 records a day, then probably Flink is not the right choice, or it's not a reason to adopt Flink. Um, a spreadsheet might, might just do. Um, so 
if you actually have a valid stream processing use case, then do a quick feasibility check if what you actually want to do and what hardware you have remotely matches. Um, is that at all possible? And I th think for most use cases, state size and network are the two most limiting factors. So it, just take time, look at one task manager. Here we have a very simple pipeline. We have a source, we have a key by, a stateful operator with some state and um, a sync. And now if we start with, with state size, the only relevant state uh, or meaningful state here will have in the stateful operator. If we use a file system state backend, it, it will be in memory here. Um, so it's basically about memory size. And the, the amount of memory you need will basically be the state size of an individual state object times the number of keys. Um, the number of keys, of course, divided by the number of task managers because we're only looking at one process here. So that's, that's fairly easy. There are, of course, a lot of things that you can or cannot consider, uh, like Java object overhead, depending on how many state objects you have. It, it might be relevant, it might not be relevant, but doing something, having some kind of feeling for how large this is going to be will definitely help. Um, so that's basically about state size. Um, in terms of network, well, there's, of course, first your ingestion. Uh, that's just going to be the number of records times the size, again, divided by task managers, so number of records per task manager here. Then you have the shuffle, and there most of the data is actually sent to another task manager. So whenever, the, basically in all cases where the key is not already on the right task manager. So you will send most of your records out again, um, and you'll get a lot of records from other task managers in this key by operation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then there's, of course, the sync, and we'll send out records again, and it's again just the rate times the size. Of course, the sizes will vary depending on the business logic and so on, but you know that. There's one thing that we've, we've neglected here, which you shouldn't, because it's actually in a lot of cases pretty relevant, and that is um, checkpointing. So, and this will also contribute to network. Depending on, on your infrastructure setup, this is going to be the same network or differently accounted for. But um, you shouldn't neglect it because if your state is very large compared to your ingress, this is the much bigger uh, chunk of, of data. Um, so here we have the overall state size, this time in serialized form, but um, we're not taking account for that here, um, times one of the checkpoint interval um, in seconds in this case. Um, yeah, if, if you've done that, then you have a rough overview of whether what you're trying to do will actually yeah, be able to succeed. You know whether you need to optimize where, or whether it's, it's trivial in terms of the scale anyway. And the last thing that I mentioned is don't think too much about your business requirements. And um, there I, I basically want to give you two examples that I've often seen. Um, one is, let's take this, exa uh, this example here. I want to send an alarm with, when the number of transactions per customer exceeds three in 10 seconds. Pretty basic requirement, um, but there's a lot of room for interpretation. So if, if events come in all for the same customer with timestamps here, with a timestamp event at four, time four, event at time eight, event at time 11, uh, 13, sorry. Uh, sh should, we, should we actually send an alarm? Should we send an alarm now? It's out of order. More events coming in. Should this be an alarm? It's not completely clear, uh, in, in my opinion, when, according to these business requirements, we should send an alarm here. Um, and some of the possible interpretations are maybe, probably not, but maybe tumbling win uh, windows of 10 seconds then basically would only send an alarm for the 15, because there we have 10, uh, between 10 and 20, we have three events. Or maybe we meant something like sliding windows, in this example with a five second slide. So here we would send an alarm at 11 for the window five to 15, and then again 15 for the window 10 to 20, could be. Or we mean something more dynamic, where whenever you, we see an event, we looked back 10 seconds in event time and um, count the events there. And if that exceeds three, then we send an alarm and we would send out a lot more alarms in that case. 
So that's that's one aspect. There's there's one more. Um, so if we see the 13 here and we know maybe there will be events that are out of order, do we fire immediately or do we wait for the 11 to arrive to also incorporate this information in our alarm? Same situation up here. Do we fire at the end of the window or do we fire immediately when the, inside the window we have reached the count? All depends basically on, on what you're actually doing and what your requirements are. And it's definitely not a problem to start with such a requirement because usually you're not, not used to think about time that explicitly. This is basically something that, that comes with stream, uh, stream processing in my, in my experience. But where things become difficult is if your, or the, your development organization doesn't have the authority to actually have these conversations and to ask questions and to refine the requirements, but are basically left alone with such a requirement and then don't know what to do with it. And then it's, in, in case of Flink, as with every other um, project, just a lot of um, uh, ambiguity. The other example uh, is this requirement. Um, we receive these two files every minute, transactions text and quotes text, and we need to transform them and um, uh, join them, and once we have joined them, there needs to be exactly one output file and the whole thing needs to fail atomically or not. So either the whole file is there or the whole file is not there. And this might actually be your business requirements. In this case, it's probably not a good fit for a stream processing job. But probably your business requirements are actually about something like robustly, resiliently, quoting your transactions or um, valuing your transactions. So if you want to make this change from batch processor to stream processor for lower latency or other reasons, then don't try to exactly re-implement your batch processing job in a stream processor. This will not get you anywhere and will be unnecessarily complicated. Um, take a step back, talk to the people who originally came up with these requirements and yeah, think about your, your business requirements again and how they, these could be modeled in a stream processing job. Yeah, so we actually have our requirements clarified. They're fixed, set in stone now. Um, so we can uh, go to development now. And this section is going to just be a big bag of, uh, yeah, gotchas in the, in the space of Apache Flink development. First, you probably need to decide, do I use the data stream API or do I uh, use uh, SQL table API? And some of you might have seen that slide or a similar slide. Um, it's basically the story, um, the slide is from Stefan's keynote um, in San Francisco. It's basically the story that if you have an analytics use case or a simple ETL use case, then probably the table API is a good fit or SQL. And if you have an application that is more, um, yeah, about an application use case, then the data stream API might be a good fit. It's a lot of it has got, got to do with data types, schemas, fine crane state access or not, things like that. But even if you have an analytics use case or a simple ETL use case, there are a few things that if you have these requirements, you will run into trouble at some point in the table API. And in my opinion, better not start with it in the first place, but use the data stream API. So if you actually want to upgrade your job and carry over state, this is something that the table API only, would only support by coincidence. Um, because in the table API, you don't have control over how your job graph in the end looks like. It's, there's the query optimizer and so on. So slight changes in your query can actually result in a different job that is not compatible anymore. So if you want stateful upgrades, table API is probably not the right fit, at least right now. If you cannot lose late data, so late data arriving after the watermark in Flink, then the table API is also difficult. In a lot of cases, you cannot control what happens to late data, it's just discarded. Or if you want to change your application during runtime, if you have updating rules and you want to apply them um, or you want to insert them via control channel, um, anything in that direction is also going to be difficult with the uh, table API. 
So I'm going to focus on the data stream API um, going forward, mainly because that's where um, I've seen most use cases personally and um, I'm more experienced in. When it comes to data types, make use of deeply nested um, complex data types. Um, Jackson's JSON node and uh, things like that have, have proven particularly valuable. Um, key selector get key can, can basically gives you the opportunity to return anything, use that. Um, it's, it's going to make um, keying much more fun. And again, don't think about schema evolution, um, but I don't want to reiterate this. Why you, why you actually, why these are our worst practices most, mo uh, mostly has to do with the serialization. So in a distributed system like Flink, for most use cases, I think serialization is one of the major performance killers or that, where you can do the most things right or wrong. Um, generally, the simpler your data types, the better, and simplicity of the data types is more important in terms of performance than actually choosing the right um, serializer. So you can get maybe an order of, or a factor of three by using POJO over Cryo in terms of performance, but just not using your whole one kilobyte JSON object in your stream processing job, but only the data that you need uh, will make much, much bigger difference than, than having a fancy serializer. The key types actually, in a lot of cases, matter the most because they are part of every state object, uh, keyed state object, and part of every timer. So um, if, you, if you use keyed state and you have very complex keys, then this is going to be yeah, serialized and deserialized on every access if you use the RocksDB, data, uh, RocksDB state backend, for example. All of this you can and should tune locally. So you just run your job at maximum speed in your IDE, profile it, and you'll see where um, your effort goes. And locally, if you don't do something, uh, yeah, some crazy computations, um, a lot of it will actually be serialization. Another pattern that you see more often than you think, actually, something like that. We have a source stream. Um, we deserialize our records in a flat map. Then we key by fields, cities. We have a time window. We have a count. Um, then we filter by a certain region, America, and then we write out the events again. Obviously, you should do the same thing that a query processor in the table API would do. Um, you should project early. Um, so if you only use the city's key anyway, don't deserialize the whole object and don't drag it, al uh, drag it along, along. Filter early. And even if you actually need all the data because you need to write out everything to the next system, it might make sense to do something like this where you only deserialize the city um, and all the rest of the object you keep as a byte array in, in an envelope um, and just write it out to Kafka as it came in. Um, if you have a lot of key by operations, a lot of operators, this will make a big impact because it's not deserialized and serialized in Flink, I don't know, 20 times or so. When it comes to con concurrency, I see a lot of mistakes by people who are new to the, the whole programming model and paradigm of Flink. And also people f familiar with it um, sometimes do this just by coincidence by using some internal library that does this. And um, if, if you share state between tasks via static variable often, um, this is, depending on what you do, this easily just leads to bugs if you're, what you're sharing is not uh, thread safe, obviously. Um, it might also lead to, lead to deadlocks that are not not necessarily your fault, but it's just the way that the framework acquires logs in threads, like the checkpointing log, and the way you acquire logs on your static um, variables might just be different order and you run into deadlocks. If this is not a problem, you'll still have a lot of synchronization overhead and, and log contention. I've seen one use case where there was a lot of, um, yeah, Basically, all the tasks on one task manager, uh, task manager were sharing the same object in their custom metrics reporter, and that led to minutes of um, basically task threads being installed on um, on getting the log to write out metrics. And it's super hard to debug because basically your job just shows back pressure for some reason, um, but or it's back pressured, but it doesn't show it. Let's let's put it like that. Um, 
So it's um, something to, to take a look at, in particular if you share library code from, from internal libraries. The other big anti-pattern here is to spawn your own threads and user functions. Um, there's usually not no need for it, and it leads to, to bugs, mainly because in when the user function is invoked, this happens under the checkpointing lock in, in Flink, um, or by the mailbox thread in the new model. Um, and during that time, no other timers can fire, no checkpointing can happen, and so on. Uh, if you now th spawn your own threads and emit records in, in these threads, then you're basically not under the checkpointing lock anymore, and you could, yeah, basically you don't get any consistency guarantees anymore that checkpointing otherwise would give you. If you want to spawn new threads just to do, uh, basically, reduce wait times while querying external resources, you can use async streams. It basically takes care of checkpointing and time management. Um, if you spawn external threads to schedule something in the future, use timers. These are also managed by Flink. Um, if you just want to increase the parallelism, just increase the parallelism via Flink um, for that particular operator. When it comes to windowing, um, in my opinion, this is also an anti-pattern, basically custom windows. Um, I think I wouldn't use them, or I wouldn't use them anymore. Um, they were useful when there was no process function, but now I haven't seen a good use case uh, where you couldn't have used a process function and would have been much simpler and straightforward. Uh, and you don't have to think too, so much about how your framework, uh, your, your code and the framework is interacting. And Basically, to write good custom window implementations, you basically need to read through the window operator code, which I think the class is about 2,000 line of, lines of code or so, um, and understand that to not to make any mistakes. So just use the key process function for that. Um, the other um, thing that sometimes people do is they have a time window, sliding time window, 30 days, five second slide. Um, no pre-aggregation. Um, this basically means every record is kept 500,000 times in state, in this case. So it goes into 500,000 slides of each window, um, and since there is no pre-aggregation, it's actually kept in state 500,000 times. Um, you could argue that's something that Flink should do better. I probably agree. <laughs> um, if you don't, if you would use pre-aggregation here, then it would at least not, there would still be 500,000 windows per key open at the same time, and you would save the aggregate that ma uh, many times, and just do the math, whether that's possible or not for your use case. But generally, sliding windows, long sliding windows with a low sliding interval is difficult by nature. Curable state, um, nice topic. Um, for those of you who don't know it, um, it's basically you can mark state objects and fling querable, and then you can, with a client from the outside of your cluster, you can query the value, the current value of a managed state in Flink. There are once in a while, there are questions on the mailing list, but also from, from customers. Can I use querable state to share state between my parallel subtasks, or to share state between different subtasks in my pipeline? Basically. The answer now, I guess, is stateful functions, but um, we didn't have that until an hour ago. So um, this can work. I have seen it work, but it's there are a lot of gotchas. Um, so first of all, querible state state access is not thread safe. So in in RocksDB, it, it doesn't happen to be a problem because it always goes to RocksDB. Um, in case of the file system state backend, where everything is on the heap, you can't see anything. You can see state objects where some of the objects have already seen an update from a record, others haven't, half-written records, stale records, all the concurrency bugs that, that you normally have. Performance, question mark. I think querable state has never really been tested for high-throughput use cases um, in, in production setups. Um, Consistency guarantees, you can get them right, but um, as Stefan also managed these, uh, mentioned, these back channels um, for checkpointing, they're kind of difficult. You need to 
you need to know exactly what you're doing and whether this will actually introduce some inconsistencies uh, if a failure happens at the wrong time. And generally, the, yeah, the advice is use querelable state to get insights into your pipelines while they are running for debugging, for monitoring purposes, but don't build your core business logic on top of them. This might change when quer this querelable state feature becomes more um, or gets more developer attention again and is improved in some ways. Um, but right now, this is what I will go for. And then to finish it up, two classics from the data stream API. One is the uh, always keying by the same key, why I key by. It's basically something you need to do because you don't get a keyed stream again um, without a key by unless you use a data stream utils reinterpret as keyed stream, um, then you save yourself one serialization that would otherwise happen uh, every time again, although there is no shuffle necessary. And the other one that's probably the biggest performance killer that I see quite often is just having unnecessary initialization code in your per record methods. Um, yeah, just use the rich function open for initialization logic and, and you're good to go. Um, there's also an issue with error handling here, but I'll leave that to the, uh, to the reader, I'd say. Um, okay, I think we do have a little bit of time for testing. Um, so I think one or two slides. Um, you know, testing pyramid is usually you have user-defined, uh, or you have unit tests at the bottom, you have a lot, of that, a lot of them, and then maybe on the top you have something like UI tests, and you only have a few of them. For Flink users, testing pyramid often looks like that. Um, basically, you test your user-defined functions um, without any interaction with the framework, and then you deploy everything, maybe locally or, um, or in a test cluster or so. Uh, you put records into Kafka, and you read records from Kafka, and you assert whether that is actually what you, what you would expect. There are two things that I want to, to point you at, uh, which are abstract test harness, a utility that is not a public API, but it's used in Flink quite a lot, and the mini cluster resource. The mini cluster resource is a genuine role, uh, rule that spins up an embedded Flink cluster, which you can use for integration testing within the IDE or within your um, CICD pipeline. Um, the abstract test harness, um, yeah, as I said, it's a small framework within Flink. Um, you can wrap your um, user-defined functions or your custom operators inside the, of that harness, and then you send in elements, you send in watermarks to trigger event time triggers, you can set the processing time from the outside to trigger processing time, um, processing time timers, and um, then you can assert on the output of your operator. So it gives you a very good way to test stateful and time-dependent operations in Flink without actually spinning up the whole environment. If you want to, to check out some examples, there are a very trivial Flink job where I've written a couple of tests with this, um, both of these, um, the harness as well as the um, Flink um, mini cluster resource. Okay, now we actually want to go live. Um, a lot of problems often arise because people have not really um, tested with um, spiky load before in their test environment. Um, you, of course, have seasonal, seasonal fluctuations, which most people are, are perfectly aware of um, during the day, during the week, and so on. Um, in reality, probably the load looks more like this um, because you have timers, windows fire periodically, upstream events, do micro-batching, basically just for technical reasons or because your use case has some time dependency. And then there are a lot of small things that also create additional small uh, spikes. If you actually care about latency, care about tail latencies, then I think you need to consider all of them. Um, in particular, what the watermark interval, if th this is set to, f let's say, five seconds, timers will only fire f every five seconds, and all of them will fire. Um, GZ pauses, depending on what you're doing. Um, if you want to test something before, test rep um, reprocessing scenarios 
um, catch-up scenarios. And in these cases, the whole thing will look more like this. Everything will become pr more problematic. You'll have more unaligned streams. You will have more state. You will have more timers. You will have more back pressure. Checkpoints will take longer. They will time out, and, and so on and so forth. So if you good in such a scenario, then you're probably good in most scenarios that happen during normal operations. In terms of monitoring and metrics, don't start once uh, you go to production. Um, start as early as possible. It's really the best way to learn about the runtime of Apache Flink is by changing your job, seeing what does it do in, pro uh, in your environment, how do the metrics change, why does that happen, and you try to understand how Flink works. Um, don't use the Flink web interface as a monitoring system. It's not built for that. Um, it's as a terrible user interface for as for a monitoring system. Um, use Prometheus, use InfluxDB, or any of the other integrations that um, Flink provides. Um, if you expose the Flink web interface to too many users who are interested into too many metrics, this will bring down your job. Um, Don't use latency markers in production, in particular if you uh, set the metrics latency granularity to subtask. It's nice to find sources of latency, but in most cases, the latency that you as a user are interested in is the event time lag anyway. So just add custom metrics that measure the event time lag at all the important stages of your job, expose they, these as a custom metric, a histogram, and you'll probably have more meaningful, more performant metrics than the latency markers. In terms of configuration, don't just choose RocksDB by default because it's the newest and the one that can deal with the most state. It's just slower than the file system state, uh, state backend and um, harder to configure. Um, you can always use the state processor API from Flink or with Flink 1.9 to switch later um, to another state backend, something that wasn't possible before. Don't use NFS, EBS for local directory of of RocksDB, you've basically gone to stream processing for local state. Don't put your local state uh, on the network. Um, and don't play around with slots and slot sharing groups unless you know exactly why you're doing that. So you, if your job's not behaving well, look into serialization, look into everything else before you start breaking up slot sharing groups and so on. Usually it's not, not worth it. It will break chaining. It will, um, make everything more complicated to reason about. So first, try to understand other reasons for bad performance. Yeah, and now we're in production and we're, we're in maintenance mode. Um, so I have 34 seconds left. Um, so basically, my only advice is with a fast-paced project as Flink, just never upgrade. Just leave it like that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Konstantin. Yeah, questions. Uh, th thank you for the great talk. I have two questions regarding serialization. Uh, one is about keys. What do you think about uh, keys serialized by Avro inside Kafka before consuming uh, by, uh, by Flink, and the keys serialized by Avro inside the Flink state? Uh, and uh, in other, the second question, uh, when I have a large object, exactly the worst case, uh, uh, but it's a business object I have to put forward downstream, uh, I have it serialized by Avro, and then I, inside my Flickr application, I need just a few elements of it. I can partially deserialize, I can imagine some scenarios how to do it, but I would probably need some support from the Flink API. Is it true or do you, have you ever met something like that, that partially deserialized Avro? Because yeah. it can be done, I can imagine something, but it's uh, for discussion, so if you have a solution, just tell me. <laughs> Thanks. So re regarding the first question, Avro as generally as, as serializer for keys or all values, totally fine. Um, in terms of performance, as well as evolvability, Flink, Pojos, and Afro don't make much of a difference and, and are what, what you 
should go for. You cannot evolve the object though, the key, uh, the key. Also, if it, uh, although it is Afro. Um, regarding partially deserializing Afro, you can of course not do it if you use, for example, the schema integration that Flink offers, uh, because that will basically just already give you the full object. But if you do that, let's say in a flat map after the source, you don't deserialize in the Flink Kafka source, you deserialize in a flat map after that, then you can call Afro yourself. Of course, you need to deserialize it once, but then what you send downstream could be anything, right? And then you deserialize everything once, but not 20 times. That's all I have right now. Uh, hi, so you mentioned that if there are too many metrics in the job manager that can bring down the job manager, is there such problem for task managers and what is large for a large number of metrics? How many is too, too much, approximately? I don't know. Sure, and uh, what? So you, you, you cannot go to the task manager directly for the metrics, um, but I don't know how large or how many metrics you need uh, to bring down a job through the job manager. Okay, and that's only for using the UI. We're just exporting using the, the, the Prometheus. RDA. Yeah, the, the, the metrics support are a different story. Um, it's it's just the, the metrics server in the job manager, basically. Oh, okay, yeah. thanks. The REST API, basically. All right, then um, let's thank the speaker.